chapter 20, as we're going to study the Word of God from this morning. Revelation chapter 20. Sure, if you have the Bible with you, you'll turn there with me. Is my name written in the book of life? 
When that roll is called up yonder, will my name be one of those names called that says, Call me a blessing, my father? You see, today it does not matter on how many deeds or titles or honor rolls or certificates your name may appear in this life. Beloved, if your name this morning is not in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says you'll spend eternity without God. Now, first of all, what is the book of life? Young people may wonder, what is this book you're talking about? Well, the Bible talks about the book of life, and Philippians 4 and verse 3, when Paul said of some of his precious sisters in Christ, he said, I beseech you, Odeus, and sent to you, that they all be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, with sudden, whose names are in the book of life. The book of life is a book that contains all the names of those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The book of life is mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation alone, and we see here that God keeps a complete, accurate, and up-to-date record of his old people. Now, let's look at some passages this morning from the Word of God very briefly that talks about this great book that you need to make sure your name is written in this morning. Remember back in Exodus 32, Moses, speaking to God, pleaded for his children, the children of Israel, and he said, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if not, blot me out, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Speaking there of the book of life. I'm reminded of Psalm 69, 28. When David, speaking of his enemies, when he was on the rod and hiding and in depression, and he said, Let them be blotted out of the book and not be written with the righteous. In Malachi 3, verse 16, the great prophet said, Then they that feared the Lord spake one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him and them that feared the Lord and called upon his name. You come over to the New Testament. There we see you and I in the church in Hebrews 12, verse 23, when the writer speaking to us says, But ye are coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, here in Hebrews 12, the terms of Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, general assembly, church of the firstborn, they're all speaking of us, the church. And he said his names are written in heaven. Luke 10, verse 20, Jesus tells us to rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Now, do you believe that this morning? Do you, by the eye of faith, believe as a child of God your name is in the book of life? Well, let's talk this morning how you get your name in the book of life. And let's talk about how that if we're not careful and, and faithful to the Lord, it can be blotted out. And also how vital it is that you make sure that your name is written in the book of life. Again, how's it written there? First of all, let's talk about some things that does not put our name in the big block. We say, first of all, that morality alone, beloved, will not save you. Just being a good, honest person, being a good neighbor, helping and paying your honest debts will not save you. You know, when you talk about a good moral person, I think about Cornelius. He was a very good moral man, one of the best you'll ever see. The Bible says he was not saved. In Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that Cornelius, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Listen about him, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house. And he gave much all to the people, and he prayed to God always. Can you say that to yourself this morning? Here we have the first Gentile convert, a very powerful man. 
He's a devout man, a religious man, and he feared God with all his heart. He taught the Bible to his family, and he prayed to God always. He was a given man. He gave to the poor and those that needed help. And you know what the Bible says? He prayed always. I wonder, we may have some of the assembly this morning who don't even pray every day. I hope that's not you. Hope you don't find yourself just calling upon God in prayer when you're in trouble. But you pray to God always. Cornelius, the Bible says, pray to God always. Probably at morning and noon and at night. And he prayed to God always. Now, if you hear a person like that today, very devout, very religious, very sincere, good moral person, prays all the time, you would say, well, that person is probably a saved man. But you see, the Bible says that Cornelius was lost. Why? Because Cornelius had never been born again from the New Testament on. He had never been baptized for the mission of his sins. We see all these good things about him in Acts 10. But if you look at Acts 11 and verse 14, the Bible says of Cornelius, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said to him, Send me to chop up and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. And here's what he said to Simon, which is to Cornelius, who shall tell thee words whereby thee and all thy house shall be saved. Acts 11, verse 14. The Bible says that Peter showed Cornelius and his household what to do to be saved. Yet he was baptized for mission of his sins that day. So being this morally good, would not save you. Also, obeying the doctrines and commandments of men will not save us. You know, traditions is what Jesus is talking about here. Maybe traditions or family traditions are sometimes practiced, but yet they might not, may not be found in the Word of God. And that's how the Pharisees were in Jesus' day, Matthew 15, and verse 9. He said, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Love it, it's only true. It's only true if you can find it, thus saith the Lord in the Apostles' Doctrine of the New Testament. Also, we see just being conscientious or sincere will not save you. Acts 26 and verse 9, Paul said, I thought very within myself, all do many things against Christ. You know, he was very sincere in his early life, soul was. You know what? He felt he was doing right. He felt he was saved. Let me ask you this morning. How do you know you are saved today? How do you know that your name is in the book of life? Well, some might say, well, I know it's there because I feel it in my heart. But beloved, are feelings in your heart a proper standard to determine your soul's salvation for all eternity? We don't use the standard of feelings with other matters in life, do we? You know, one, no one says in their bank statement, well, I know it's right because I feel it in my heart. If they're not adding and subtracting from that balance. No carpenter says, well, I know that board is 10 feet long because I feel it in my heart. If he hasn't taken the proper standard in the measuring tape to measure it. Well, beloved, when it comes to a far more important matter than bank statements or building a house or board lens, you know, our soul salvation. So many are willing to trust their eternal soul just for their feelings. But yet our feelings, we know again, can deceive us. Proverbs 14, 14, the Bible says, There is a way that seemeth right. There is a way that feels right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Listen, the way one feels about their salvation does not change the truth of God's word. Just the way you feel about math does not change the truth of it. So how can you know you're saved today? How can you have assurance your name is in the book of life? You see, those that have done the will of the Lord, those that obey God and the gospel, don't have to guess whether or not they're saved based upon the feelings of their hearts. We can know that we're saved because our salvation is based upon the unchanging truth of God's holy word. Again, let me never base your salvation on your feelings. 
the fact that your life is in line with the will of God. Also, we see today that, you know, one just thinking their name is on some list somewhere doesn't mean it is. Those 12 men of Ephesus, you remember, they thought they were right before God and they were deceived. They just thinking their name was there. But yet it saddened them not obeying the gospel. You know, one's name is written in the book of life when they obey the gospel. Their name is added there when one obeys the gospel. The Bible says in Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have light into the tree of life and enter into the gates of that city. Now, secondly, this one we'll talk about how can their name be blotted out? You know, we talked last week about how that some teach the once saved, always saved doctrine, and we know that doctrine is not found in the Word of God. And beloved, according to Scripture, when you read the Bible and you talk about this complete, accurate, up-to-date list, we can see the book of life is written in erasable ink. The book of life, by God, is constantly subject to revision. We've seen in these passages that names can be added to this list, and names can also be taken off of that list or blotted out. You remember, again, in Exodus 32, when God delivered the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, they were in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, and Moses was coming down off that mountain. He just received the Ten Commandments of the Lord, and he heard a noise in the camp down below. And he thought it was a sound of war, but as you remember, Moses drew closer to the bottom of that hill. He saw God's people, the children of Israel, shouting and dancing and worshiping that golden calf. Remember what Moses did? He was so angry, he threw down those Ten Commandments of God and broke them. He was so angry, and he said, very adventure, he said to the people, you sinned a great sin. Here I'm up here getting the commandments that you to live by that will save you. And you've already turned to worshiping an idol without you. Moses said, with her adventure, I'll return up that mountain and I'll make atonement for your sins. You remember how Moses got up there and he pleaded with God not to destroy the children of Israel. He even offered his own soul for a ransom for those people. He loved God's people so much. He said, Lord, if thou wilt forgive their sins, but if not, I pray thee, blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses was willing to stand in eternity without God if he would forgive the children of Israel. What love. In Exodus 32, 33, the Lord said to Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, it will I blot out in my book. But also at this point, what are some things that will cause our name to be blotted out of that book? We see the adjustment failure to overcome. You know, we have temptations daily before our eyes every day. The old devil never lets any of us rest. We see that giving in to your own lust of the flesh, giving in to temptations that will draw you away from God, have your name blotted out of that book. Of not overcoming sin, but letting sin overcome you. The Bible says in Revelation 3 and verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Jesus says, I will not blot his name out of the book of life, for I will confess his name before my Father in heaven. <laughs> also, we see the love of money can cause our name to be taken out of the book of life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after they bear from the faith. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. As I was thinking about this, I was reading just last week of Christy Scott in Russell, Alabama. She's on death row in Franklin County, and she's there because as a mother, she's convicted of death sentence because she allowed her little six-year-old boy to burn up in a house. She's
She could hear his screams of, Mama, please help me and save me. But yet she had taken out a $100,000 life insurance policy on that little boy just a few days ago. And as I was reading this, reminded of you probably remember that account, Doug Evans, the district attorney for Franklin County, he said of Christian Scott, he said, this is one of the most heinous crimes I've ever seen tried in the state of Alabama. So cold and so callous to let her little child lose its life because of the love of money. You see, beloved, money's a good servant, but it's a terrible master. The rich young ruler thought he needed his money and wealth more than he needed his soul salvation. He forsook the Lord thinking that his material things would make him happy. And there's nothing wrong with having material things in this life. God gives them and God can take them away. All good things come from the Father of life. But we see the problem is, is when we love those things more than we love the Lord. The Bible says this young man, the rich young ruler, went away sorrowful because he loved his possessions. Well, thirdly, the love of this world. We blot our name out of this book. You see, Loving sports, entertainment, our stuff, to the point of forsaking the assembly or forsaking God. The Bible says what calls us to have our name taken out of the book of life. Again, beloved, there's nothing wrong with good, clean, wholesome sports or entertainment. But when we allow those things to come between us and God, we allow that to come between us and our worship, and we could be here, but we choose not to be because. We love those things in the world more. The Bible says that God has a problem with that. In 1 John 2, verse 15, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world, the love of the Father, if it is, it's not in Him. And again, I'm not talking about if you have to work on Sundays, you can't help that, or if you've got someone sick at home, you've got an emergency. Be it with someone that gets up in the mornings or on Sunday evening or Wednesday night, whatever, and just could be here, but just chooses not to be here. Does it desire to worship God? My friend, that is what John is talking about there in that passage in 1 John 2, verse 15, of loving, not the world. Also, we can see of losing your first love. Do you still have your first love for Christ that you had when you first came to Him? Jesus told that church in Ephesus, he said, I know your patience, your love, and for my name's sake, you labor and has not fainted. Nevertheless, Christ said, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Could that be you this morning? Just like in a marriage, when a husband and a wife, they love each other with all their hearts. They get up in the morning wanting to talk to one another wanting to help or please their maid or, or make them happy. When John says in Revelation 2 and verse 5, he says, that's how it should be with our love for Jesus. Our marriage to Jesus Christ. I hope you can never wake up in the morning and open your eyes and put your feet on the floor without thanking God for waking you up. Without asking God to help you during that day, make the right decisions and to keep you from the evil one. You see, husbands and wives, if you take your spouse for granted, you're headed for trouble. That marriage will eventually crumble. It is the same way with their marriage to Jesus. Those Ephesians rarely that left their first love. They took Jesus for granted. He was not first in their life. If they could make it to worship, fine. If not, fine. No big deal. They left. Their first love. Also, we see the lukewarmness that causes us to have our name blotted out. Revelation 3 16, the church of the Odyssey said, I know your works. I know you're not cold or hot, but you're just lukewarm, just drowning in the fields. And we see there that they're living for the Lord on Sunday and living for the world Monday through Saturday, actually nauseating God. Also, we see. Finally, this morning, the works of the flesh and cause our name to be blind out of the world. He's talking there about willful sins of the heart. Willful 
little sins of the flesh. It's found in Galatians 5, verse 19. He says, we'll cause one's name. He brought out of that book. He said, don't be deceived. They which practice such things should not inherit the kingdom of God. Beloved, this morning, we all need to make sure our names are in the book of life. And to do so, we must realize that we must repent of any sin that we might be hanging on to in our life. That we might be practicing in our life. We've all heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. So be careful what you practice. Beloved God, I forgive you of anything in your life if you're willing to turn on it. Doesn't matter what you've done or haven't done, the Lord will forgive you. First John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Our text this morning says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life is cast into a lake of fire. Is your name this morning in the book of life? Are you saved from your sins? If you've never obeyed the gospel today, if you've never been baptized for the mission of your sins, why not come today? Why not come and put the Lord on in baptism and have your name written in heaven? As a member of God's family, have you been faithful to Jesus? Could it be that you've been separated from the Lord in your marriage to Him because of things in your life that you put ahead of Him and you need to be reconciled to the Lord today? If that's the case, we hope that you will think about that and you'll realize how much God loves you. But again, we stay in the Father's name. 